<clears throat> well, I've already told you uh, probably more than once already that um, we're going to look at the relationship that Jesus has with us and that we have with him through several pictures given to us in Scripture. And today we're going to focus on marriage and we're going to focus on the idea that we are one body. We are the body of Christ. Um, so let me begin by reading the, a text that um, has to do with marriage. Um, I've already read one that has to do with the body of Christ, and that's the one I'm going to refer to uh, back to for the second part of the sermon, but this is what we're going to look at in the first part. And here, um, Paul is, is basically telling husbands and wives what their relationship is to be like, and what he tells us is that it's, it'd be patterned after Jesus' relationship with his church. So uh, his relationship to us as our Savior, uh, as basically our husband, and we as his bride, is, is that mold, is that pattern, is that example that we are to follow in our own marriages. And we'll just touch on that briefly, but what we really want to focus on is his relationship to us and what that means, the blessings that are ours, as well as what that calls us to do. So let me read beginning in verse 22 of Ephesians 5. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless." So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself. And the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now, we have been uh, looking at how our lives are to reflect Jesus. Remember, his nature, his character. And we're talking about the man, Christ Jesus. We really can't reflect his divinity, but we can as Jesus reflects the moral character of God because he is God in human flesh. That is the example he holds out to us that we are to imitate. Jesus is our pattern. He is the one we are to follow. Again, he's not walking down the street somewhere and we just sort of fall in line behind him. That's not what he means, and that's not what he meant even back in those days when he said to his disciples as he was calling them, follow me. He meant, follow my example. He follow him, yes, literally, but also follow his example. So whenever we have a question as to how we are to apply whatever it is that the Lord calls us to do, or of how much we should give ourselves, invest ourselves in serving the Lord, or how strongly we are to love him. We just need to look to Jesus, to his example. How it is that Jesus obeyed, how he interpreted the scriptures, how he applied the scriptures, how much he gave himself to his father, how much he loved him, because that is the image that the Spirit of God is actually working within each one of us who love the Lord and are trusting him. Now, today we're going to do something just a bit different. We, this is what we have been doing over the past several Lord's Days. And we're going to look at our relationship to Jesus from the different <laughs> pictures that he gives to us in his word. And I've already told you what those different pictures are that we're looking at today. Marriage, uh, body, vine in the branches, a shepherd and his sheep, a temple, a lampstand, and a family. 
And we want to look at what each one of these tells us about what our Lord Jesus does for us, what he calls us to do, how much he loves us. But we also want to look at these to see what it is that he calls us to do for him uh, through each one of these various analogies. And by the way, let me just mention ahead of time, there is overlap. So I'm just going to try to focus on what may be unique uh, to each one, if, if there does happen to be something that is unique in each one of these. Now, this is a, a big, uh, a, t a tall order. This is, this is a lot. We could spend a lot of time on any one of these things. The Puritans have shown us that that certainly is possible. I mean, one man wrote a commentary. Uh, I think he preached on the book of Job for 30 years. And it's collected in something like 10 or 14 volumes back there on the shelf. It is possible to expand these different uh, images, but we're going to look at each one of them just briefly and try and get the big picture. So this morning, let's focus particularly on the first two, the image of marriage, our marriage to Jesus, and that we are his body. So first, let's look at our relationship to Jesus from the perspective of marriage. Jesus says he is our husband, and we are his bride. That's what we just read about in Ephesians 5, verses 22 through 33. Now, in this passage, we really do see three things, at least three things. First of all, the love that Jesus has for us. Secondly, how we are to respond to that love. And then thirdly, how this is to be a model for our marriages. Now, first of all, we see the love that Jesus has for us. And let me just start off by saying that when, whenever you have a, a parable or a picture or an analogy that's given in Scripture, there isn't always a one-to-one -one correspondence in every area of that analogy with our lives. There isn't in any of these, really. Uh, so there are similarities and there are differences in these analogies. Now, there are, for instance, differences between his marriage to us and ours to our spouses, but there are also similarities. And I wanted to point that out because one of the big differences between them is the way that Jesus had to go about getting his bride versus the way that we do. And this shows us, again, something of the great love and mercy Jesus has for us. The table reminds us of what Jesus had to do to have us as his bride. Now, the way we go about it is that we meet the people that we're going to marry, our spouses, in a variety of ways. Sometimes at church, maybe at college, maybe at a college group, or at a youth camp. You know, it could be a childhood relationship, could be one that's developed sometime, you know, uh, through our growing up, and eventually this, this happens. But we meet them in a variety of ways. And when we meet them, uh, we're, we're not always believers and they're not always believers, but if we're believers then obviously they should be already believers if we're thinking about marrying them. And I just wanted to use this as a, a reminder to us that to those of you who aren't married, that you shouldn't become involved with an unbeliever uh, if you're thinking about marriage. And I'll just remind you, the outside packaging may look attractive, but the inside isn't. Their heart is not. If you love the Lord, you want to marry somebody who loves the Lord. That is, as a matter of fact, what the Lord calls you to do as well. You're not to be unequally yoked. What fellowship of light and darkness, unrighteousness and righteousness, we're as different as night and day. Now, when we meet our spouses, our potential spouses, little by little, we build a relationship with them, and eventually we come to a conclusion. Because of our shared faith in the Lord Jesus, because of our similarities, because of our mutual affections and because of our shared goals, that this is the Lord's will and that we enter into a lifelong covenant, the covenant of marriage. And so we move forward into that covenant. Well, that's the way we do it. That's the way the Lord has orchestrated it for us, but that's not the way Jesus found his bride. Because when he came to us, uh, we were darkness. We had hearts that were black and full of corruption. We weren't beautiful in any sense. We didn't love him. As a matter of fact, we hated him. We weren't innocent, but we were guilty. 
and we are on our way to judgment. It's represented in Scripture in a variety of ways of uncleanness, filth, harlotry, various ways, but, but we were not anything to be loved or attractive, but Jesus made us to be beautiful. He made us to be attractive. He rescued us. That's the first thing that He had to do. He had to make us into somebody that He could have a relationship with before He could marry us, and that's exactly what He did. As we know, Jesus became one with us. Jesus obeyed. Jesus died. He rose again from the dead in order to change our hearts, in order to cleanse us, in order to clothe us, in order to give us the right goals, the similarities. That's what the gospel is all about. Jesus gives us His Holy Spirit to make us like Him. Now, we know that Jesus also worked with us, and He will continue to do so throughout our lives, giving us His Word and His Spirit to make us more like Him. Remember that in the Jewish culture, the husband would go out and take his bride and bring her to the Father's house, and that is ultimately what Jesus is going to do for us. But to bring us to the Father's house, to heaven, there's a work that He has to do in us. He has to make us like Him. And He does that through His death and through His obedience and through this you know, imputed righteousness, this, this, that he, you know, this salvation that He gives us in one whole package. But as some of the Puritans would say, and as Jonathan Edwards in particular while we're here in this world, He works in our lives to fit us, to prepare us, to make us ready for heaven, to wean us from our love for this world and the ways in which we reflect this world and to make us more, well, more ready to enter into that world in which we're going to spend eternity. So Jesus works in our lives to prepare us, to bring us into His Father's house, into heaven, where we might be with Him forever. And essentially, that's what Paul is telling us here in Ephesians 5, verses 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. What Paul just said there was, was what we just looked at. Jesus died, he, he, he obeyed, he died, he rose again in order to, to save us, and he works through us by his word and spirit to prepare us for heaven so that he might present the church to himself in all of her glory. And now as our husband, he loves us as his own body. He cares for us. Paul continues in verses 28 through 30. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. Now we're going to look at the body imagery next, but again, we can't escape that imagery in marriage. By the way, let me just point out that Dr. Ferguson on Wednesday uh, pointed out how much Jesus really loves us. And he was expounding the last part of the Upper Room Discourse, chapters 13 through 17 of John's Gospel, the last meal Jesus shared with his disciples. And the last thing that he does before the meal is over is he prays what's called his high priestly prayer. And Ferguson points out as the disciples were listening to Jesus pray, and they heard him express the, the desires, the, deep, the deepest desires of his heart, they began to realize, perhaps for the first time, just how much Jesus really did love them. And that's something we need to remember, that if we're trusting in Jesus, that's how much He loves us. He loves us as a husband, is to love His wife. He loves us as we love our own bodies. Jesus has a deep and intense love for each one of us with all of our imperfections, although He doesn't leave us in our imperfection. He's working in us to make us more like Him, but He still loves us, and we don't have to measure up at least in ourselves, we do in Jesus before He loves us. He loves us when we trust Him. As a matter of fact, He loved us before we trusted Him. He gave us His Spirit so we could trust Him, and now we are forgiven and clothed. We're in Christ. He loves us, and we need to remember that He does. His love is so great that He wanted to become one with us, lay down His life for us so He could have us, to love us and care for us for the rest of eternity. This is the love of Christ for us. It's the love of a husband for a wife. 
Now, as our husband Paul also reminds us that he is our head. And as our head, we are to submit to him. And he says that in verses 22 through 24, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands and everything. Now, I'm not going to focus on that here. I'm going to focus on that in the next image that we're going to look at in just a moment. Now, that's the love Jesus has for us that's expressed to us through this picture of the marriage of a husband and a wife. He is our husband. We are his bride, and he is a husband to us. And I realize for, for those of us who are men, we might have a little bit of difficulty connecting with that image, thinking of ourselves as brides rather than as husbands. But I think you understand Jesus loves us, and he laid down his life for us. He cares for us and protects us. Now, what is our commitment then to be towards him? Well, we've already read about it. We are to love him in return as a wife loves her husband. Uh, nothing, we might say, hurts more in this world than unrequited love. When we show somebody love, we open our hearts to them, and we have that love rejected. Well, we need to ask the question, will Jesus show us all this love only for us to return coldness or indifference? His love calls us to love him, to love him above all, to set ourselves aside for him and to make him our greatest love. Remember what the greatest commandment is. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength. That applies to Jesus as well. Not only for the love that he has shown you, not only for the love he continues to show, but remember he's going to love you. He's going to love us throughout the rest of eternity. In heaven when we die and when he brings in the new heavens and the new earth, he's going to take care of us. He's going to love us, provide for us. We are going to be filled with his love. So we should love him for this love. We should also love him for his beauty. I mean, think about how beautiful Jesus is, his moral perfection, how good he is. And let that draw your heart out also to him. As his bride, we need to purpose in our hearts to set ourselves apart to the Lord Jesus, to be committed to him, committed to him as he is committed to each one of us, which means we need to let go of the other loves. We need to be his alone, be faithful to him. And when I say that, of course, it doesn't mean we kick everybody we love out of our lives, but what it means is we put him first, and then we love them by loving him. If we love Jesus and, and love others the way he calls us to, we are loving them the way we should be loving them. If we love them apart from Jesus, then we're really not doing what the Lord calls us to do. He is first, and then we, you know, in our obedience and our love for Him, we shower that love upon others in the way that He calls us to. So we do need to have all of our affection in Him and love others, as it were, through Him. And our Lord Jesus also wants us to read His love letter to each one of us, His Word to find out how we are to love him. Remember, the, the commandments are really meant to teach us what love is, how we are to love God, how we are to love our neighbor, and when we love in that way, we are loving Jesus. So read the Word of God to find out how to love Jesus and how we can devote ourselves to make him happy, even as Jesus devoted his own life to make us ultimately happy. That's what happens in a marriage relationship as well. Each is committed to the other's happiness. Jesus is committed to our happiness. We need to be committed to his happiness. Now, I'm just going to take a moment to say that we need to use that relationship, Paul is telling us, the relationship that Jesus has with his church as the paradigm, as the example, as the model that we are to strive after in our own marriages or in our future marriage, as the case may be. Remember, Paul writes in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. So husbands, don't use your authority to push your wife around and make her your slave or your servant, but use your authority the way that Jesus used his authority to care for her, to protect her, as Jesus 
used his authority again on your behalf. And then Paul writes in verse 22, wives be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. Submit to your husbands as they minister to you, as they are as Christ to you. That's what Jesus calls you to do. So that's what we see in the first relationship of the marriage, the husband and the wife. Our, you know, Jesus' relationship is love for us and our love for him and how that works as a model for us in our lives. But let's look secondly at our relationship with Jesus from the perspective of a body. We are the members of his body. He is our head. Let me just read a few verses from Ephesians 4, verses 14 through 16. Paul says, as a result, we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Now here I'm just going to draw a few, few points from, uh, from this analogy of the head and the body. Now, this relationship, as we've already seen, follows from the marriage relationship. When a man and a woman are joined together in marriage, they are no longer two but one, and that doesn't just refer, of course, to the act of marriage. That refers to our relationship. We become not one person, but we are bound together as though we are one flesh. We are united, and that union should be permanent throughout life unless, of course, there's really serious sin. Or, or death takes place. But we have been united to Jesus. We are joined with Him by His Holy Spirit. So we are no longer two, but now we are one with Him. We are one body with Him. Paul writes to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians twelve thirteen, For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves are free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. Now, let me just say briefly, this means at least three things, okay? Jesus is our head. He calls the shots. We've already seen that before, but we're going to look at it a little bit more. We are his servants, secondly. As the members of his body, we are to carry out his will. Just as our bodies obey our heads, you know, our minds, so we are to obey our head as the body of Christ. And then thirdly, as the members of the same body... We are members of one another, and so we are to love and care for one another. So first of all, Jesus is our head. Jesus is the one who directs the body. Jesus is the one who is in control. Now, I think we really begin to understand what that means when we move from asking the question, what is it that I want to do today, to what does Jesus want me to do today? When Jesus humbled Saul, remember who becomes the Apostle Paul, um, actually at that very moment, essentially, when he humbled him, as he was on his way to Damascus, and remember he was on his way there to arrest everyone he found who was of the way, to imprison them, to drag them back to Jerusalem, to put them on trial, to try to get them to blaspheme or deny the Lord Jesus, and if they don't, then to put them to death. When the Lord humbled him on that road... And he understood for the first time who Jesus really was. The first question that he asked was, what do you want me to do, Lord? So let's, let me read about that in Acts 22, verses 6 through 10. This is where he was giving his testimony before the Jews, and you can imagine how this impacted their ears. But he goes on, he says this, But it happened that as I was on my way approaching Damascus about new time, a very bright light suddenly flashed from heaven all around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus the Nazarene whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me saw the light to be sure, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, get up 
and go on into Damascus, and there you will be told of all that has been appointed for you to do. When Paul was converted, when he was humbled, he knew that there was a change of authority, a change of headship, and he immediately saw Jesus was his head. He called him Lord, which means you are the one who is in control. Remember Jesus earlier said to his disciples in Luke 6, 46, in what we call the Sermon on the Plain, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? You see, Jesus is Lord. He is our Lord. We are to call him Lord. And as Lord, he is the one who tells us what we are to do. And, of course, what he tells us is right and good. And if we have a different opinion, we're wrong. He's always right. He's God in human flesh. So Jesus is our head. And we need to be concerned about what it is that he wants us to do. And let's not forget, the one who calls us what to do is also the one who laid down his life to redeem us, the one who daily cares and provides for us, and the one who is going to love us and provide for us throughout all eternity. There is a very strong motive there for us to want to listen to what he says, besides the fact that what he says is right and is good. Now, he is our head and we are his body. What is, Jesus is saying through this is that we are the instrument through which he wants to do his work in this world. He is, we are the ones through whom he acts. Uh, just as we control our bodies through our heads, basically through our minds, and we direct them to do what it is we want them to do, I tell my mouth speak and it speaks, and I tell my hand move and it moves, and so forth, so Jesus is our head. And he wants to direct and work through his body. He wants to work through us to accomplish what he wants to do in this world. And what does he want us to do? Well, in a nutshell, he wants us to spread his gospel throughout the world. He wants us to gather in his lost sheep. He wants us to disciple them, uh, to teach them the things that he taught his disciples and he wants us to send them to work in his harvest. He really wants to use us in the same way that he used his disciples. I mean, what is another, another name for the book of Acts? And you know, we say the Acts of the Apostles. Well, there's another name for it. The continuing Acts of Jesus Christ through his apostles. He worked through them to extend his kingdom. They were his body, you see, and he was the head. And he was telling them what to do, and they did it, and the kingdom grew. Well, the Lord wants to do with us the same thing that he did with them in the book of Acts. He wants to work through us to extend his kingdom. The book of Acts, in, in a certain sense, did not end in, in chapter 28. There is a continuing work the Lord Jesus is doing. That's why he called us into the kingdom of heaven. That's why he gave us his Holy Spirit. That's why he gives us gifts. That's why he disciples us, is so that we might bear this fruit as he works through us to do his will in this world. So Jesus is the head. We are the body, the instrument through whom he wants to work. Finally, by the way, I should mention too, the idea of uh, the imagery of the body, even though it's not mentioned here, was mentioned in Ephesians 5, that Jesus loves his body and he cares for it as we care for our own flesh. So we need to always bear that in mind. And here again is the supreme picture of his love for us, not just that he died, but that he suffered the wrath of God on the cross for our sins. But finally, he wants us as his body to be concerned for one another. Uh, you've probably heard this before, but if one of the members of your body gets hurt, as a matter of fact, I imagine Jamie uh, experienced this recently when his hand got cut in that machine and ended up crunching your nail. But the first thing that happens is the rest of your body comes around it to try to comfort it or to help it or to do what needs to be done in order, you know, to alleviate the pain. You know, our head directs our other members to go over there and to do that. Well, that's what our Lord also directs us to do in the body of Christ is to love and to care for each other. We've already seen examples of that in, in what I've read. He tells us that we are to be patient with each other. He tells us that we are to do all we can to preserve the unity and, and the peace of, of his body. 
uh, not just among ourselves, but the whole body of Christ, right? Everybody who calls upon the name of Jesus, everyone who believes the gospel and is trusting in Jesus. Paul writes in Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 3, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So that's one thing we do within the body. He tells us that we are to use our gifts to encourage and strengthen one another, uh, to build each other up so that we as the body of Christ might do His work. Remember, this is not one man's work. This is the work of the whole body, and the body has to have what's called body ministry. You know, each member of the body ministering its gifts to the other members and building them up so that we can, as the people of God, do what the Lord calls us to do. That's what Paul is actually talking about in Ephesians 4, verses 15 and 16. He says, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. And I think you can see here that every part of the body has its part to play. It all works together. You know, if, if, if the members of our body could feasibly all do their own thing um, and not take, you know, the commands from the head, what would it look like? Well, I think we know what it looks like because we, we've seen it happen. There are people whose minds do lose that connection and the members of their body begin to do various things according to not what they necessarily want to do, but the only thing they can do and they're spasmatic and so forth. Well, the Lord doesn't want that kind of body. He wants a body that's working together and is able to do what He calls us uh, to do. So we, all of us, need to be involved in this. And then, of course, He tells us to love and care for one another and to empathize with one another in good times and in bad. He writes in 1 Corinthians 12, 26, which we saw for our meditation this morning, and if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. This again shows us that we are connected. We're no longer individuals. We are one in a certain sense, we're, we're one flesh, we're one body. We are the bride of Christ, united with Jesus, and we are one flesh with Him, one spirit with Him. So we are all connected. He wants us to, to live that connectedness, to enter into each other's lives so that together we can be stronger than we would be apart, so that together we can work towards doing the will of our head, which is bringing the lost to faith in Him. As we move towards the, the Lord's table, let's again remember the great price that Jesus paid in order to make this happen, in order to gather us together into one body so that He might marry us and so that we, as His people, might do this work. Jesus loved us with a great love, a love that we can't even comprehend. And He came into this world as one of us to save us through that work on the cross, through that work of obedience, through a whole life of obedience, that He might make us His bride and the members of His body. And our Lord now calls us to love Him in return by loving one another and building each other up. You know, Jesus is in heaven. He's perfectly blessed. He has everything that He needs. But the one thing that he still needs, the needs that Jesus has, are really the needs of his body. And uh, it's one of the hymns that I don't know that we're singing that one this morning, but one of the hymns reminds us, you know, when, he, when the hymn writer asks, well, what can I do for you, Lord? You know, you're in heaven, you're perfect, and so forth. And then he thinks, wait a minute, part of Christ is still on earth, his body. You have needy brethren here, and I can minister to them, and through them I can comfort and I can bless and I can cheer the Lord Jesus because we are connected to Him. So that's something we should think about when we think about how do we love Jesus in return. Well, we can do it by loving one another. And we can do it, of course, by doing what our Lord actually calls us to do, 
which is as we build up one another and strengthen one another and make, as it were, each of us spiritually healthy, that we unite together and we go out to do the work Jesus calls us to do, which is to gather the people of God together who are scattered throughout the world, gather them together into the church, into the flock, into the body, into the bride of Christ through the gospel. That's ultimately what, what we're about as believers in the Lord Jesus. That's what Jesus wants us to do. That's that work he calls us to. So may the Lord help us uh, to do that. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's again meditate upon the love that Jesus has for us and what that calls us to from the image of marriage and the image of, of a body. And as we think about these things, let's also prepare. Uh, to come to the Lord's table and to remember what Jesus has done and to look to him for grace and strength to be able to do this, what he calls us to do.